time. You'll also want to find 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter number 2 and also the book of Jude, the little small book that's right before you get to uh, Revelation. Those will be some very important books uh, that you'll want to go ahead and have on hand as we go through this. Um, very important uh, study tonight. Um, I want to say before we get into this, this is going to be challenging. And when I say challenging, it's going to be challenging for our minds. Most of your um, preachers, most of your teachers, most even your Bible scholars, they are really good with Revelation until we get to chapter 9. Chapter 9 marks an area that becomes challenging for our faith to comprehend. And this actually is one of the main reasons that most people refuse to really dig into Revelation. Because chapter 9 reminds us of how supernatural this book is. Chapter 9 reminds us of how different and difficult this can be to comprehend. Because honestly, tonight as we get into this, we won't be able to get very far, and I'll go ahead and just tell you that to start with. But I can tell you that as we dig into this, it's going to seem a whole lot like some kind of strange sci-fi movie. I'm just going to tell you that. Because it's, it's challenging for us to understand. We can try to explain it away. We can try to um, dumb it down into our terms as much as possible. But the fact remains is that this is a very supernatural scripture with a very supernatural uh, um, uh, comprehension and as we go forward, the, the, the things that take place on this earth is unless you are understanding it from a spiritual standpoint, you will, not, you will not be able to understand this book. And you will not be able to understand what's happening here. And understand that we have went into this period known as the tribulation, the seven years, and it has been described to us in seven seals. We're, uh, we're okay with that. We understand that the seven seals, it has a lot to do with the uh, natural disasters, so to speak, as they have, went, as they have uh, come on this earth, even some that uh, maybe are not natural disasters, but whenever we, we look at the war, we look at the, the, the uh, famine, all of that can be explained by the hand of man. All of that can, can be understood that man had an important role in all of that coming to pass. Well, we've seen uh, over the past few weeks, we've seen the first trumpet judgment. Remember that seventh seal was open and after that seventh seal came these seven trumpets. We saw that first trumpet and it was the judgment on the land. We saw the second judgment, that was the judgment on the sea. We saw the third trumpet, and that was the judgment on the fresh water, the wormwood. We saw that. All of this can be explained through uh, um, astrology, through, through different uh, uh, types of uh, disasters that we would say, okay, there's a meteorite that hits the earth, something that, uh, of, of that nature. And then as we went into the fourth trumpet, we saw that there was a, a he, that, that the heavenly bodies, the sun... The, uh, uh, the moon, the stars, a third of them were darkened. Now that's hard for us to comprehend because we've never had to understand what it would be like for a third of the sun to be darkened or, or, or a third of the moon to be darkened or even a third of the stars to be darkened. However, we can still somehow, some way, wrap our mind on how that would look how it would cause cooling, how, it, how the, there would be uh, 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 such devastation in our day and night cycle. And it, we, we could understand that. But I'm going to say that as we go to the fifth trumpet of all the judgments, to me personally, in my opinion, this is the most devastating, the most scary, um, the most uncomprehendable time that we have here in this fifth trumpet. So whenever we have looked at the end of those first four trumpets, the heavens are unraveling at the seams. 
And then whenever we come here to chapter 9, the focus will change. We're no longer looking at the heavens. Now the focus is going to be that we're looking on hell. We are focused on what's happening in hell. And whatever heaven will do to devastate this earth, I'm going to say that it, it is um, only a small part of what hell is going to do to this earth. And understand that whenever we end it, I want to go back to, to, to Revelation 8 real quick, and I want to read that last final verse right there of Revelation chapter number 8, because there's something here I want you to see. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants, notice that, to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. Trumpet 5, trumpet 6, and trumpet 7. Understand that notice that this was, could only be described with the word woe. And I, say, and I didn't get a chance to touch on it last week, but woe is, is, is an unusual word. It's, it's a word of damnation. It's a word of judgment. It's a word of sentencing. It's a word of execution. It's a word of curse. So what it's saying that these first four, remember I told you it took me seven or eight verses to hit those first four trumpets. It'll take 50 to get the last three. So those first four is only a warm-up. It's the pre-show to what's getting ready to happen. But it said woe to a very specific group. Notice that, that this is woe to the earth dwellers. Those, those that, that, that the inhabitants of the earth. That's a very specific term. Don't pass over that. Because the earth dwellers or the, the inhabitants of the earth, it was mentioned in chapter 3. It was mentioned in chapter 6. Mentioned in chapter 8, it'll be mentioned in chapter 11, chapter 13, and chapter 17. What is this telling us? These are the ones that have a very specific title, the earth dwellers, the inhabitants of the earth. They are a, this is a term for the unredeemed. This is the term for the unbelieving, those who are living on the earth. But watch, why, is the, why are they called the dwellers of the earth or, or the inhabitants of the earth? It's because they have clung to this earth. They have clung to whatever they can find on this earth. They have clung to the world, the temporary things that they have, the tangible things, those things they can touch, the hold, see, feel, possess. This is all there is. So they have clung to that. And here they're saying, the angel that flies across says, Woe unto these that are clinging to this earth and the possessions of this earth. So why is this angel flying? Why is there this angel flying across the sky saying woe to these ones who have clung to the earth? Why would there even be that? I'm going to say that it was an act of mercy. I'm going to say that one more time, he's, he, the Lord is crying out and giving that one more chance, that one more time for, for, for them to be a part of that innumerable multitude that has been redeemed, the one that stands before the throne of God. He's giving them a chance. What do we see, folks, over and over and over again in Revelation? That the Lord is a God of mercy. He's giving them one more chance to cry out unto Him and to believe. He's saying, listen, you didn't believe me whenever I said I created all this. Now that all of this is being destroyed, do you not see what's happening around you? Cry out unto me. Come unto me. Believe in me. Have faith in me. Do you see what's happening? He's, he, he's giving it one more time. Because watch, in chapter 9, verse 21, there's going to be something about that sixth trumpet in which they won't believe. It said they won't repent. They won't repent. It's almost as if they can make it through the fifth trumpet and they can make it through the sixth trumpet. It's almost as if they have been affixed. It's almost as if there's no chance for them to repent. That, that, that their mind has somehow or another been affixed, affixed to the hardness and they're bound for eternal doom. That's what we're seeing here. But the first four trumpets, remember this, the first four trumpets involved the devastation of the physical nature. Go ahead and flip this. We already have it up here. These first four right here, it, it has the physical nature of this earth. But now this begins something new. And I want to say this. 
I've always told you to take the Bible as literal as possible. I said that the literal interpretation you'll always find is the more realistic, the more real, the more accurate interpretation unless the Bible plainly tells you that it's symbolic, that it's uh, 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 an allegory, that it's, that it's uh, uh, an analogy, a simile. Unless the Bible plainly gives you that notification, always take it literally. Well, guess what? Whenever we come to chapter 9, it's going to talk about how uh, symbolic this is. It's going to show you how symbolic this is, and it's going to point that out. John is going to make it plain and clear that this is something different than what we're being described here starting in Revelation 9. So let's jump in and let's read these first 12 verses or so of Revelation 9. And we're only probably going to cover one or two verses tonight, but you've got to get this because there's a whole lot of background on this that unless you understand a lot of what's happened in the Old Testament, you cannot understand this fifth trumpet. So let's read right here Revelation 9 and verse number 1, and let's start off. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit... And there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. And to them it was given to, uh, that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And notice that, as the faces of men. Notice that very closely. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth was as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots and many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, uh, hath his name Apollyon, and watch, one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Now let's just let that settle in just for a moment. Just try to digest that, and you say, Ryan, what in the world is happening here? First of all, I want to say this. Back in verse number one, there's something that, that, that we need to know. Verse number 1 in in your King James was talking about a star falling from heaven and it reads as if he had saw it right then fall from heaven. There's a problem. That verb fall is in what's called the the, the, the past perfect tense. Meaning this. Meaning that it had fallen and it is still fallen And the the continuation, that's the perfect part, the continuation of the effect is constantly happening here on earth. So that's why it's written as as it had just fallen, but whenever you look at the tense, it means that it had fallen previously as well. So it means that even as today in 2022, guess what? It's still falling. Do you see this? Now, why is this important? Because we have seen stars fall from heaven a lot. We have seen, we have, we have seen uh, 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 the, the uh, in fact, just uh, previously in the previous study, we saw the, uh, the, that word aster in Greek 
or where we get asteroid from, whenever wormwood fell, we saw all of that, that 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 was some type of celestial body. And I told you, I said, it means... It could mean star, it could be a comet, it could be an asteroid. I said, but the actual term just means heavenly body. So I said that specifically because here we are and we know that this is not a falling star. This is not twinkle, twinkle little star and the star is falling, okay? That's not what this is. Why do we know that? We know that because this is different because right after it says that a star has fallen from, from, from heaven to earth, it says the key to the bottomless pit was given to Him. Last time I checked, last time I checked, stars are not hymns and hers, okay? So here we are. This, this star that has fallen is different. This is the exact type of terminology and the exact type of language that we see in Job 38, 7 whenever angels are talked about as stars. Okay? This is it. But this makes sense. As what we know about the Bible, what we know about history, what we know about what's happened so far in the Word of God, this makes sense. Why? Because we know about a star or an angel that has fallen before. We know that there was one that was called Satan, one that was called Lucifer, one that was called the day star, or one that was called the son of the morning, and he fell. We saw that from Isaiah 14. We know that Isaiah 14 verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Verse 15 of Isaiah 14 says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Okay? which is exactly what we're seeing here, exactly what we're seeing here in Revelation 9. So Satan was thrust down to Sheol and below Sheol to what's called the recess of the pit, the bottomless pit. Now, Jesus told us this too. We don't just take Isaiah's word for it. Isaiah is a great, is, is a great uh, 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 word. But Jesus told us this as well in Luke 10, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said this, And He said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Notice what Jesus said. And scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Okay? Notice this. We also, you don't have to flip there right now because we'll be there in a few weeks, but if you looked over in Revelation chapter 12, you will see a very in-depth uh, discussion about a battle that will take place in heaven. You'll see Michael, the archangel, and the angels of heaven, and they will be warring sometime during the seven-year tribulation. They will be warring against Satan and the fallen angels there, and there will be a great, great... And Satan is described as the dragon. He's described as the, uh, as the uh, dragon, and he's cast down to earth. Why does this happen? Notice that in Revelation 12 verse 4, it had already happened once before. Satan had a fall once before. The same fall that Jesus said he saw as he fell like lightning. The same one that Isaiah 14 talks about when Satan was cast out. But what did Revelation 12 will tell us? Revelation 12, 4 will tell us that his tail took a third of the angels with him. These, these, these pride-filled, these pride-filled sinful angels that chose to follow Satan and his proud arrogance that they too are cast down and taken with him. So at some point previously, there was a fall. But we also know that since that fall of Isaiah 14, since that fall that Jesus talked about in Luke 10, since those fall, Satan has access to the throne. We know this, we know this because of, Jude, uh, uh, of Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1 describes the time, remember, when Satan, it came a time for, for, for the sons of God to present themselves to God and there's Satan in the midst and what are they doing? They're having a discussion about Job. So he has access to the throne. But after Revelation 12, Satan will no longer have access to the throne of God. He will no longer have access to accuse. We know that right now he's the accuser of, of the brethren. 
We know that right now he stands before God Almighty right there in the throne room making accusations toward you and me, about you and me, and he is casting those accusations. But after Revelation 12, Satan will no longer have the ability to make any more accusations because it says, it says that we have overcome him by the testimony of the Lamb of God and the blood. We know that. So he will lose that access. But understand that this is different. Now, now what I do believe is that Revelation 12 matches up because Revelation 12 and Revelation 13 right hand in hand with the midpoint of the tribulation. That right there is, is right with the abomination of desolation. What I believe is that Satan, after he loses his access to the throne of God, then what does he do? He comes here on earth and he says, I will enter into this man, the Antichrist, and I will set up myself on earth and the people of the earth will glorify me as God. Do you see this? Do you see how this works? So understand that there is a lot going on. I've said many times whenever we, we, we were in our, our prayer series, I said what we see happening here on earth is a mirror image of the heavenly battles that's taking place. That's why we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, and what? Rulers of the air. This is where we're at. Understand this. So we see this, that, that this is a time, but notice, but notice, but notice. We know that Satan does not have the key to the bottomless pit. We know that from Revelation 1 verse number 18, what did Jesus do? Whenever Jesus died on the cross, it, it, it told us in the first chapter of Revelation, He said that He had the keys to death and hell. Do you see this? But now watch. Now here we are. It's not enough. It's not enough for Satan... It's not enough for Satan to have the demons that are presently here on earth, and it's not enough for him to have the demons that were the third that were fell from him up in heaven. It's not enough. Now think about this. If we're wrestling with the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, if we're wrestling with them now, think about how much more they're going to be wrestling with them whenever the ones have been turned from heaven and have fallen... And now the ones that are present, and then let me give you one more thing, the restrictive power of the Holy Spirit has been withdrawn. How much more, how much more reign is Satan going to have to do his bidding and to do his evil deeds? How much more? But this pit is important. The pit, literally the abyss or what's called the abusos, the same place, if you remember, the same place that legion, whenever, whenever Jesus meets the uh, uh, demon-possessed man of Gadara, legion says, well, he, he cries out to Jesus and says, Jesus, have you come, have you come to put us, to banish, to, to put us in the pit, to put us in the abyss? And instead, he puts them in the pigs. But understand that here we have access to the bottomless pit. Now, what do we know about the abyss? What do we know about this abusos that, that, that the fallen angels that have already fallen, the one-third that fell, what do we know about this? We need 2 Peter chapter 2 to tell us a little bit more about this. 2 Peter chapter 2, and he's going to tell us about the type of demons and the type of fallen angels that are here in this pit. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4, if you have it, say amen. amen. For if God spared not, notice this, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to reserve unto judgment. Notice that. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with, with an overthrow, making them an example unto, uh, unto those that after should live ungodly. Now this is important. It's said that they were put in hell. This word is different. This word is Tartarus or Tartarosus. 
This word here is different. Why did Peter decide to use this Greek word Tartarus? Okay, now watch. This word right here comes straight from Greek mythology. Okay, and what this right here is, is this. The Holy Spirit, whenever he, whenever, whenever he wants to express different terminologies, he always uses something that's common to the language. If you remember, whenever Jesus wanted to, to describe the fires of hell, he always used the word Gehenna. Why did he use the word Gehenna? Gehenna, the valley of, 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 of Hinnom, or, or the valley of Gehenna, was the trash dump of Jerusalem. It was the place that always had a perpetual fire that was burning that they would cast their garbage into, and it was always burning day and night. So what he did is he used the modern ter terminology of that day, Gehenna, to describe the fire in hell constantly burning. That's what he used. But Peter, talking to a mostly Greek audience of that day and that time, he described hell as Tartarus. The reason why is because they would have known what Tartarus was. Tartarus was what in, in Greek mythology referred to the dark, dreadful place lower than the grave of the, 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 the lowest of all the hells that was bound for the, uh, the, 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 that was used for the most wicked and rebellious beings and they suffered the most severe punishment. That's what he said. So Peter tells us about Tartarus. He said in Tartarus that they have these fallen angels these devils, these demons, that, 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 that because of the nature of their iniquity, that's very important that you understand that, the nature of their iniquity and their wickedness and their sin, the Lord has plunged them down to this lowest of low, this lowest pit of hell, and bound them with chains of darkness in this pit and reserved them to judgment. What judgment is it? The judgment of Revelation 20.10, whenever Satan... Death, hell, all of the demons, they're cast eternally into the eternal lake of fire. That's, that's the judgment that awaits these. They know this. They know this. They know that that is their judgment, that that's what, what they're bound to. But notice real, real, real quickly, what else did Peter talk about? He talked about Noah and the flood. What else did he talk about? Sodom and Gomorrah. Keep that in mind. Now, let's go to Jude real quick. Lord, have mercy. This is going to get going, getting good. Watch this. Jude, Jude it, don't, it, it just has one chapter. That's why we don't ever call it a chapter. But Jude, look in verse number 6. Look in verse number 6. And the angels, notice this, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own Habitation. You see that word habitation. I really want you to focus on that word habitation. They left their own habitation and hath, uh, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. That's what Peter told us, correct? Now, keep reading right here in verse number 7. Even as what? Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner given themselves over to fornication and, given, and going after what? What's this word? Going, what? Strange flesh. And set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, let's focus. What did they do? What did these, what did these angels do that was so horrible to put them in Tartarus? to put them in the pit, to put them in the lowest of all the hells, what did they do? Jude tells us that they abandoned their proper original domain. They abandoned their proper original domain. They stepped out, watch, they stepped out of their appointed realm. you got to get this. They stepped outside of this. He says this. He said they left their habitation. Okay? Now what does that mean? That, that, that's that's the, the, the little funny Greek word, okoiterion, that it's only used twice in the entire Bible. Only used twice in the entire Bible. Guess where the only other place that okoiterion is used in the entire Bible? You ready for this? It's used in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 2, and listen closely. Don't, don't, don't turn there, but it's used in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. Watch what it says. For in this we groan earnestly. This, this is us, okay? We groan earnestly 
desiring to be clothed upon with our habitation, our house is what it says, our house which is from heaven. What is it speaking of? Our habitation, our akoiterion, is the glorified body. The glorified form. That's what this is saying. Now what is it saying? It's saying that the angels left their glorified state. They left their proper realm. They left what was supposed to be their, their, their appointed domain and stepped outside. Now, how, how is this happening? How is this? And notice this. Just like 2 Peter, it's always linked with two things. It's always linked with the flood of Noah, and it's always linked with Sodom and Gomorrah. What was the main sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Homosexuality. The Sodomites. That was it. Now, and it went after, what does the Bible say? Strange flesh. Meaning, watch, they stepped outside of their normal realm which is a man and woman relationship, they stepped outside. And remember, it was so bad. It was so bad that whenever they went, whenever the angels came into Sodom to warn Lot and his family, what did Lot have to do? Lot had to take the angels, bring them inside his house because the men were going to rape them. Okay? In fact, they, they realized that these new men ha had walked in, in to, 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 to Sodom and they showed up at Lot's door beating down the door just about saying, give us the men. Give us these men. That's how, that's how uh, 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 desperate that these people are. That they're going after this strange flesh. This, this, this new thing to sodomize these angels. But notice this. The, these angels that are locked away in the pit of the abyss because of their tendency to, to, to go after strange flesh, to leave and abandon their original estate. Notice this right here, that their relationship is craving the strange flesh. How does this link to the days of Noah? Ready for this? It's going to blow your mind. Okay? Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 talks about when the sons of God the Bene Elohim comes after, watch this, the daughters of men. Now this right here is what blows people's minds. And I'm sorry if, you, if you've sat under a pastor or a preacher or a teacher that wants to explain this away in some other form because it's too much for them to understand. I get it. But understand that these Bene Elohim, the sons of God, the only thing you can find is angels. Fallen angels, okay? They took on the estate of men. Ryan, how can that happen? I don't know. But every other place in the Word of God, if you've noticed, they've always been described as men. Every time. When Jesus, even the heavenly angels, when Jesus is resurrected, what was it? Mary thought that they were men, men at the tomb. Remember this? They're always in the form of, of a man. Well, these, these beings that seek embodiment that they have now become of the, the, the form of a man. They were attracted to the daughters, notice this, the daughters of man, notice this, and they're going after them, and they create an unusual race, a hybrid race, okay, called in the Hebrew, the Nephilim. Now, it, it says in your Bible, the great men of renown, okay, the Nephilim. Now what does that mean? In Latin, it is gagates, which is where we get the word giants from. Okay? You see in this? Now notice, this is the problem of Noah. This is not just, oh, Cain and Abel, they had an argument, and it, this was the sin of Cain, and this was the sin of Adam, and this... No, 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 no. We have a gene pool problem. We have a genetic problem that is filtering. Why? Because what, what, what was the original promise? What was the original promise of Genesis 3.15? That, that God would put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of who? The, ser the serpent. Notice that. He knows that the seed is coming. So what is his main objective? To pollute the seed. Do you see this? That's why this is happening. So he's, he's polluting the seed, he's perverting the seed, and God looks down and he sees whenever he says, the, whenever Noah has found grace in his sight, whenever he looks and he says there was one man, and notice it wasn't just Noah, but it was his family. 
that they had preserved the rightful seed. You see this? So now we're going to get rid of all of this other because this is the only seed. Okay, you see this? So therefore, whenever they drown in the flood, Whenever, that, whenever, whenever these gagates, whenever these, whenever these Nephilim, whenever they're drowning in the flood and the body dies, where does the soul go? You see this? Do you see this? Where does the spirit go? They're seeking embodiment. But the ones that have polluted this, they are reserved in chains of darkness, chains of darkness in the pit of hell. Now, I know it's a lot. I know y'all look at me like, what is going on right now? Do you see, see y'all, see this? Do you see why people don't want to don't deal with this? Do you see this? Because it gets way supernatural. Okay? But notice, notice something else right here. They are seeking embodiment every chance they get. Now, if they have been reserved for judgment in the chains of darkness, now there's something that's happening here because what we're going to see is we're going to literally see hell come to earth. You, you, you've heard the phrase hell on earth. We're literally going to see hell on earth. Okay? Now watch this. Watch what 1 Peter tells us. 1 Peter, I said 2 Peter a while ago. Now let's look at, look, let's look at 1 Peter and what he tells us. Because Jesus... Whenever Jesus died on the cross, watch what happened after, after He died on the cross. For Christ, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit by which also he went and preached unto the what? Spirits in prison. Notice this. Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of who? Noah. Noah. Ain't that what we just talked about? While the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight, souls were saved by water. Do you see how the Bible explains itself? The Bible takes you all the way back. So, so these demons, these devils, these fallen angels that, that was there have been put there and they're waiting. The sin that, was the, that they committed in Genesis chapter 6, that the, that the accumulation of these demons that are in the pit right now. Why was this such a vile sin? Why was this such a horrible sin? Because what this created was an unredeemable race. You say, Ron, what do you mean unredeemable race? Because these are not just men. Right. Jesus, notice, in order for Jesus to redeem us, Jesus had to become a man. Okay? These are not just men. These are hybrids of both an angelic being and man. Meaning, there's no redemption for these. Do you see this? There's no redemption for this because there is a species problem. There is a genetic issue here and there's no way that Jesus can be a kinsman redeemer to an hybrid. Do you see this? So therefore, they committed the, 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 the most horrible of all sin whenever they created this race in their, because all it was was a plan to usurp the authority and the plan of God to redeem mankind. That was, that was his attempt. And God said, I'll take care of this. I'll fix it. And that's exactly what happened. But what was great about it is it didn't even matter anyway. Because Jesus was born through the womb of a what? Through the womb of what? A virgin. And what happened? It wasn't, it wasn't a normal seed. It was the seed of God that was brought to her womb. So therefore, there could be no gene pool problem with Him anyway. Do y'all see this? Do y'all see this? Lord have mercy. This is the importance of the belief of a virgin birth. Think about this. Think about you. You say, Ryan, this is hard for me to wrap my mind around. Okay. Is it easier to wrap your mind around the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin? Is that, is that easier for you to comprehend? That's what I'm saying. Everything about this 
is completely a supernatural thing. It's, it's outside of our realm. It's outside of our realm of thinking that this is not it. That's why it's important. That's why whenever you try to explain this type of thing to somebody that is not saved, they have no ability to understand because they have no heavenly part in them. This is only by the comprehension and the wisdom, the discernment that's given you through the Holy Spirit. Do you see this? So these Nephilim, these Nephilim, these half men, half angels, also known as, as, as giants, understand that Christ appeared to them and He announced to them right then and there His triumph over sin, death, and hell and when He left the cross and He said it's finished. Okay? This is it. So to sum it up, watch. To sum it up, you have the demons in the air that have been brought down. Okay? Then you have the demons that were already here on earth. Okay? How do we know there's demons on earth? We know, we know that there's demons on earth because Jesus told us there was demons on the earth. He said, he, he talks about the time whenever you get one demon out and seven come back in. Okay? There, there are demons present on this earth. We know that there's powers, there's principalities. We know that there, there's different levels and rankings of these, these beings. Okay? We know this. But notice what's happening. The demons in the air, the heavenlies, are brought down. The demons on the earth. That wasn't enough. So now the key is given to him because he don't have the key. Jesus gives him the key to go and unlock the pit of hell. These are demons that have been bound and locked for how long? 6,000, 5,000, whatever years. And now they know that this is their last hurrah. This is their last rodeo. They are unlocked and they're unleashed on earth to do almost whatever that they want to do. Do you see the amount of hell that is going to be here at that time? And now we're going to get in to what's going to happen whenever these demons come. What's going to happen whenever you have the amount of demonic activity on this earth at a rate like we've never seen before? At, a, at, 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 at an amount like we've never seen before? Understand how, how devastating that this is going to be. This is what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 9, the star from heaven fallen, that, who is Satan, given the key to the abusos to open up the shaft of hell and to let these demons out. And this right here is what they have. Jesus takes off his key, hands it over here, the key to Tartarosos, and he says, here it is, have at it, I'm giving you your day. Do you see what it's going to be? Folks, whenever this unleashes, we think these locusts are just locusts. Mm. Let me tell you something. This is going to be something in which even if somebody wanted to make a movie about they couldn't make a movie about There's not, there's not enough of, of, uh, of graphic design that would really be able to allow us to understand the devastation that's getting ready to happen. As these demons are unleashed here on earth doing the deed of the devil and whatever he wants to. And then, by the way, if that's not enough, he will be present in a man in the flesh to do whatever he wants to do. That's what we have. Next time, we'll talk about these locusts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, your grace. Thank you for your word of warning. Thank you, Lord, for your precious, precious understanding of this powerful word. God, we ask you that you'll help us. You'll speak to us. Lord, you'll show us what we need to see with this time. But Lord, there's very little that we can do except for pray. To pray for those who are lost. To pray for those who need your salvation. Lord, I ask that you'll deal with them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Speak to them, Father. Lord, show us, use us as instruments. Lord, just as mouthpieces, Lord, to do what you give us the direction and the instruction to do. To say what you would have us to say. And Lord, I pray that you'll 
Touch this church in a mighty way. May we reach as many souls as you would have us to reach. Lord, may we do all that you would have us to do in this late hour. Father, we uplift you, we glorify you, we thank you for your love. Lord, your mercy, your grace. Lord, I ask you right now that you'll help us. Lord, you'll speak to us. Oh, we uplift you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the precious blood that we shed for the remission of our sin. And Father, we uplift you right now. We thank you because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet all over the place. Let's come and let's pray. Let's pray for the lost. Let's pray for our sick. Let's pray for one another. Brother Mike's going to begin to sing. You go right ahead, Brother Mike.